It's time now for one more thing. Greg. Oh, tomorrow night, the Greg Gutfeld Show is live, 10 o'clock, and it's going to be so much better than the White House Correspondents' Dinner, which, as you know, sucks. We got Drew Pin uh, Dr. Drew, Dr. Drew Pinsky, uh, Tom Shalou, Cat Tim Tyrus, and we've got some special little surprises in store. Again, it's going to be live, which means anything could happen. Watch it. All right, Greg, thank you so much. You're Good welcome. luck with that. 10 o'clock. All right, and Jesse. All right, so we have a late breaking mom text. This <laughs> just in, fact checker, your first film wasn't Star Wars, Jesse. It was E.T. and you sobbed. So oh there my you God. have it. Ah, nice. Mom <laughs> calling me out for crying during E.T. I was probably really too young to watch that copied movie. copied my answer of Star Wars. <laughs> no, I think I was first, wasn't I? Anyway, um, I'm also live <laughs> no. Saturday night covering Donald Trump's counter-programming rally to yes. the uh, White House Correspondence Center out in Michigan. And Candace Owens is going to be joining me, so you definitely want to tune in 8 o'clock Eastern, Waters World. All righty. Okay, so um, we have a couple of one more things today, and I just want to let you know that Candace and I actually will be in Dallas in June for the Turning Point USA Young Women's Leadership Conference. If you can put up the full screen there, look at it. It's jam-packed with wow. uh, talent. It takes place from June 14th to June 17th. Is Ben Shapiro and we've got a woman? Ben Shapiro. Just... <laughs> well, because <laughs> men, men can speak at a Young Women's Leadership <laughs> Conference, too. Oh, That's what we're talking about. We're not okay. going to do gender identity politics okay. here. Um, Dana Lash, Charlie Kirk, Judge Janine Pirro, Kat Timp, Tommy Laren. He's going to be here on the air on Fox during that time. And much, much more. <laughs> what? He's one lucky guy. Okay. All right. Uh, all right, Candace, you, you're up. I think if I ever get time for one more thing, it's always going to be a cat video because cats hmm. make everybody happy. But yes, um, here it is. Oh! I'm a crazy cat lady, everybody. You need to know this. <laughs> so just, well, that he doesn't cat? like you anymore. Wait a minute. Did I use this one or did I, I not use cats. this one? Oh, I thought I used this one. I remember the cat on the broom. It's the cutest thing ever. Did you just, I I Craig just accused you. Yes, you stole my cat thing. video, <laughs> Candace. I did. I no. love cats. <laughs> Okay, the cat looks like it's being injured or something <laughs> like that. We're not, we're not too sure. All right. Not a fan of sweeping. So Definitely not a fan yeah. of sweeping. I'd rather see a Dana dog video than that. <laughs> oh. Okay, Geraldo. I want to give a shout out to my 98 and a half year old mom, wow. Lily Friedman Aww. Rivera. She has been uh, gravely ill over the last several days. We really were afraid we were going to lose her, but she rallied. Uh, my brother Craig is down there now. My sister Sharon, that's Sharon there with Grandma. And my sister Irene and Craig made her a Craigie omelet. And she rallied, uh, you know, her, her heartbeat sped up, uh, you know, her respiration. She started breathing more deeply. She's comfortable now. She's a wonderful, wonderful lady, the mother of five. 17 grand she was your mom she must have been through hell yeah. i can't imagine what it's like to be geraldo's mother but <laughs> she it's a great story my mom uh, from jersey city was a waitress in child's cafeteria on 42nd street and 6th avenue she met my dad cruz rivera just really literally off the banana boat it was really a banana boat uh, he was the pot washer in the cafeteria they met you know, a, a Jewish woman from Jersey marrying a Puerto Rican Catholic uh, at that, in those days, illegal in many states. But, uh, you know, they had a wonderful marriage. My dad passed a long time ago. But my mom continues on in Sarasota, Florida. I'm going to go down after this. Uh, actually, I'll do Fox and Friends tomorrow morning, then I'm going to go. She's here, to make, she's here to make sure that you're still a good boy. Yeah, she's All really, right. she's <laughs> my boy. Oh, thank you. Aww. All right, I want to give a shout out to my friend, Raheem Kassan, who is here in studio with us. And he was uh, the chief advisor to Nigel Farage during the Brexit movement. He's a compelling author. He has a brand new book out about historical speech on immigration. You can check it on Amazon.com. Set your DVRs. Never miss an episode of The Five. Have a great weekend. Special report next. Yay. Thanks, Kimberly. With just a few steps, North Korea and South Korea's leaders make leaps and bounds towards peace, laying the groundwork for a possible meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Plus some vindication for the president on the Russia investigation and what his critics decry as a rushed, one-sided report, and why the president's new Twitter pal is getting some very heated reaction. This is Special Report.
Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. An historic literal step forward in the DMZ gives us a precursor to what is a much anticipated meeting between President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong Un and what that may look like. But today, the president met with a closer ally, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, to discuss other big deals and even got a boost from a Republican report on whether his campaign colluded with Russia to win the election. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts covering it all from the North Lawn as he he does. Good evening, John. Brett, good evening to you. It sure looked like a watershed moment. The leaders of North and South Korea smiling, laughing, embracing. But the question tonight, as a result, has the world taken another step closer to peace, or could this be just another North Korean deception? President Trump began his day with the U.S. Olympic team, a perfect segue to talk about the potential breakthrough on North Korea. I want to express my hope that all of the people of Korea North Korea and South can someday live in harmony, prosperity, and peace. And it looks like it could happen. But the U.S. has heard talk of concessions before, only to get played by North Korea. Meeting with German Chancellor Angela Merkel today, President Trump said this time feels different. Well, I don't think he's playing. And, and, you know, it's never gone like this. It's never gone this far. I don't think it's ever had this enthusiasm for somebody for them wanting to make a deal. And yeah, I agree. The United States has been played beautifully like a fiddle uh, because you had a different kind of a leader. We're not going to be played, OK? We're going to hopefully make a deal. If we don't, that's fine. President Trump today announced the list of possible locations for a summit has been narrowed down to two. The president making it clear until he sees concrete actions from Kim, sanctions will remain. We will not repeat the mistake of past administrations. Maximum pressure will continue until denuclearization occurs. In the Oval Office, President Trump also weighing in today on the final Republican report from the House Intelligence Committee. The major finding, when asked directly, none of the interviewed witnesses provided evidence of collusion, coordination, or conspiracy between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. The report was very powerful, very strong. There was no collusion between the Trump campaign and the uh, Russian people. Uh, as I've said many times before, I've always said there was no collision, but what we really should do is get on with our lives and get on with a lot of things. Democrats called it a rushed job, only meant to deflect attention away from the Trump campaign. Uh, it's basically a kindergarten report. Uh, it was a light once over. The report did cite what it called ill advised contact with WikiLeaks by Trump associates and highlighted the June 6 meeting Donald Trump Jr. had with Russian attorney Natalia Veselnitskaya. Today, a new revelation from Veselnitskaya she was a government informant for Russia's prosecutor general. Uh, Democrats leapt on that one. What we have seen of her contacts within the Russian government, uh, as well as uh, um, her persistence in terms of one of Putin's top priorities, would indicate this is not a solo agent. This is someone working on behalf of the Kremlin. The president's meetings with Angela Merkel didn't have the camaraderie of the Macron visit earlier this week, but uncomfortable moments like the aborted handshake of their last visit were avoided. The two leaders quite cordial. In their joint news conference, Merkel indicated Indicating Germany is open to reducing its trade surplus with the U.S. and acknowledging the Iran nuclear deal isn't perfect, that more action is needed. This agreement is anything but perfect. It will not solve all the problems with Iran. It is one piece of the mosaic, one building block, if you like, on which we can build up this structure. And the president couldn't resist taking another shot at James Comey today, zeroing in on Comey's interview with Brett Baer last night. So did you leak other things through Mr. Richmond? Yeah. <laughs> I'll just smile and Brett. I don't consider what I did with Mr. Richmond a leak. I told him about an unclassified conversation with the president. You said in the memos, I, I said, I don't do sneaky things, I don't leak, I don't do weasel moves. But, I mean, we can argue what a leak is, but that's a leak, gonna, isn't it? It's not. President Trump tweeting today, James Comey can't define what a leak is. He illegally leaked classified information, but doesn't understand what he did or how serious it is. He lied all over the place to cover it up. He's either very sick or very dumb. And President Trump's personal attorney, Michael Cohen, won a significant victory in a Los Angeles courtroom today, a California judge granting a 90-day delay in the Stormy Daniels civil suit. Daniels attorney, Michael Avenatti, said that he will immediately appeal the decision early next week to, of all places, Brett, 
the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Always the Ninth Circuit. John Roberts live on the North Lawn. John, thanks. Well, as John just reported, an incredible moment in the DMZ as Kim Jong-un set foot into South Korea, becoming the first North Korean leader to do so in decades. Kim met with South Korea's president there, and as senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg Palcott reports, the two laid some groundwork for a much-anticipated meeting with President Trump. As North Korean leader Kim Jong-un crossed the military demarcation line at the DMZ to meet his host, South Korean President Moon Jae-in, the two nations stepped into history together. Chairman Kim Jong-un and I confirm that our shared goal is to rid the Korean peninsula of nuclear weapons through complete denuclearization. Perhaps aware that the promise of denuclearization has been made in the past and not made good by North Korea, Kim Jong-un promised this time will be different. We will make sure that the agreement we have reached, which the people of the Korean Peninsula and the world are watching, does not fulfill the unfortunate history of unfulfilled promises. The announcement's coming amid a day choreographed for the cameras. The inspection of a traditional honor guard, a tree planting with roots in the north and south. Kim signing a guest book noting the event marked a new era in peace, and then conducting a lengthy and public one-on-one -on -one discussion with Moon. Not mentioned in the pledge on denuclearization, however, any details of how the weapons might be removed or within what time frame. There was more detail in the joint pledge to work towards a peace treaty to formally end the Korean War, halted 65 years ago with only an armistice agreement. That treaty too, though, could take a lot of haggling. All of this is in advance of President Trump's meeting with the North Korean leader planned for the end of May or early June. I think this summit couldn't probably have gone better in terms of the role it will play as a catalyst for Trump's uh, forthcoming summit with Kim Jong-un. And while South Korean President Moon worked tirelessly to make this happen, even one of the summit's participants told Fox News President Trump's push on North Korea helped get negotiations to this point. I think he clearly saw this as an immediate, uh, the most challenging um, global security agenda, not just for the United States, but the whole world. Regardless of how the Kim relationship works out for President Trump, for the day and night at least, things were a bit calmer on the Korean Peninsula after last year's rockets and nukes. That's probably a good thing. South Korean President Moon is set to meet with President Trump and share notes about his summit with Kim and perhaps to give him some tips. Right. Greg Palcott, early Saturday morning in South Korea. Greg, thanks. A caravan of Central American migrants has arrived in Tijuana May and May attempt to cross the border this weekend to seek asylum in the U.S. National correspondent William Lachness reports tonight from the border on what will happen if they do. Several hundred Central American immigrants gather at a shelter in Tijuana, preparing to request asylum in the U.S. The drug cartels don't let us live in peace in our country. Fleeing violence alone is not supposed to be a ticket into the U.S., but effectively it is. We are still waiting. They're going to come and get us. They're going to take us to do a questionnaire with the attorneys to get more information. But we haven't done that yet. This weekend, American lawyers will advise the refugees on how asylum works. Many will be detained for months. However, other than that, there is a long legal process, um, whether it be in detention or outside of detention. Participating in a caravan does not give you any additional legal rights. If you illegally enter our country, you will be referred for prosecution. But these immigrants are not entering illegally. The law says asylum seekers have the right to a fair hearing before an immigration judge, should they have a credible fear of returning home. We had assassination threats from the drug cartels, so that's why we had to leave, because the drug cartels are everywhere. The caravan plans to march to the San Diego Port of Entry Sunday, but already the plaza is full of Mexican citizens making nearly identical claims. They killed our family. That's why we're fleeing from our hometown. That's why we're here. These Mexicans from cartel-ridden states have waited for days to get an asylum interview. We've been here for four days. We were hungry. We were cold. Yesterday, there were no asylums. No one got in yesterday. They returned 30 people. So lawyers say passing that initial credible fear interview is not difficult. That gets these immigrants into an already overcrowded detention system. And women, children, and non-criminals have a pretty good chance of being released. And critics say without more judges and a change in the law, scenes like this will continue.
Brett? William Lajeunesse, Law on the Border. William, thank you. The teen who confessed to killing 17 people at a high school in Florida waived his right to a speedy trial this afternoon, while the union for the Broward County Sheriff's Department has given its chief a vote of no confidence in the wake of the February massacre. Correspondent Phil Keating reports on the latest developments from Fort Lauderdale. We're here in the state of Florida versus Nicholas Cruz. 19-year-old confessed high school killer Nicholas Cruz back in court waiving his right to a speedy trial. Still no trial date. Cruz is charged with 17 counts of first-degree murder and 17 counts of attempted murder in the Valentine's Day rampage inside Parkland, Florida's Stone and Douglas High School. This new animation, based on school cameras and eyewitness accounts, shows the killer's path. He is represented by the black dot. The green dots are the victims. When green turns to gray, they've been shot and killed by Cruz, who at the time was a known threat. In the shooting's aftermath, reports surfaced that the county sheriff's department never acted on dozens of reports of Nicholas Cruz's erratic and dangerous behavior, including threats to shoot up a school. I've given amazing leadership to this agency. Amazing leadership? Uh Broward County Sheriff Scott Israel has come under intense scrutiny. 85% of the largest union for the Sheriff's Department has now voted no confidence in their boss. We have a lot to be ashamed of starting with our leader. And that's going to change starting today. The citizens of Broward County trust me. And that's who I care about, the citizens of Broward County. What the union boss said as I started this with, it's really inconsequential. Sheriff Israel accuses the union of shamefully playing on the Parkland tragedy because he's denied the union 6.5% raises. The sheriff is a complete liar. Capital letters on that. This has never been about a contract. Governor Rick Scott, who's now running for Senate, is aware of Thursday's no confidence vote, but for now is leaving Sheriff Israel put. Scott's office noted the matter is under investigation, and once it's complete, quote, the appropriate steps will be taken to hold people accountable. Nicholas Cruz remains in jail without bond. His public defender has offered to plead guilty to everything now, get a life sentence and avoid trial. But the prosecutor wants the death penalty. Brett. Phil Keating in Fort Lauderdale. Phil, thank you. The hard work, patience, and help from a website helped detectives track down the man they believe to be one of California's most elusive serial killers. Senior correspondent Adam Housley reports from Los Angeles tonight on how a genealogy website helped police get their man. For four decades, he evaded capture and stumped detectives across the Golden State. But now the man suspected of at least 12 killings and 50 rapes faces a judge for the first time, thanks to a DNA website. When it comes to a cold case, DNA is a prosecutor's best friend. Detectives matched 72-year-old former police officer James D'Angelo's DNA using genetic material stored by an unnamed relative on a genealogy site called GED Match, which pulls genetic profiles that people share publicly, so no need for a court order. D'Angelo faces charges of murder with enhancements for rape, lying in wait, burglary, and robbery. Four decades ago, his chief fired him for stealing from a store. You hate to see, see a police officer accused of, uh, of crimes of this nature. I mean, you know, serial rapist, mass murder is terrible. Investigators believe D'Angelo's alleged crime spree stopped in the mid-1980s. Since then, police say he lived under the radar in the Sacramento area. But even as detectives continue to dig into the suspect's past, it's done little to ease the fears of knowing there was a killer and a rapist at large for decades. It shakes you to the core. It really does, mostly when you grew up with the fear of him and to find out he lives right around the corner. When I was 11 years old, he killed two people across the street from my house. We heard the gunshots. It's always affected me. I'm kind of paranoid. Known as the Visalia Ransacker, the Golden State Killer, the East Area Rapist, and the original Night Stalker, 10 California counties could levy charges against D'Angelo, and he could face the death penalty. Brett. Adam Housley in Los Angeles. Adam, thank you. After coming under fire for extravagant spending, Environmental Protection Agency Administrator Scott Pruitt has decided to turn over spending approval to his deputies. Pruitt gave the authority this afternoon for his deputy administrator, chief of staff, and chief financial officer to approve any expenses he seeks above $5,000.
It looks like President George H.W. Bush will have to watch the Houston Rockets' next playoff game from the hospital. Family spokesman says the former president will remain in Houston Methodist Hospital through the weekend to continue his recovery and regain strength. We're told he is in excellent spirits and looking forward to going to Maine next month. Coming up, breaking down the budding bromance between the president and a rap artist that's leading to a bigger conversation about race and politics. Some puzzlement from several lawmakers up on Capitol Hill after they learned House Speaker Paul Ryan has forced out the House chaplain, Reverend Patrick Conroy. Conroy served as the, champ the chamber's chaplain since 2011, but offered his resignation last week at Ryan's request. Reasons for the forced resignation have not been revealed as of yet, but a spokesperson for House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi says Pelosi disagreed with the decision even after Ryan consulted her about it. Consumer spending turned in its weakest performance in nearly five years. The U.S. economy slowed to a moderate 2.3 percent annual growth rate in the first quarter. However, the rate came in better than expected, giving hope for a solid rebound for the rest of the year. Mixed day on Wall Street today. The Dow lost 11. The S&P 500 gained three. The Nasdaq finished up one. For the week, the Dow lost almost two-thirds of a percent. The S&P was down a fraction. The Nasdaq lost more than a third of a percent. With one tweet, Kanye West got the attention he often seeks, this time from President Trump, setting off a firestorm over politics and race. Fox News media analyst and host of Fox's Media Buzz, Howard Kurtz reports tonight on the bromance that has some critics breathing fire, while others are just pouring cold, cold water over the whole thing. They are an unlikely duo, famous and famously contrarian. All I gotta say is a rapper who says he's getting a bum rap, and a president who believes much the same. Social media exploded when Kanye West tweeted his support. You don't have to agree with Trump, but the mob can't make me not love him. We are both dragon energy. He is my brother. The president declared this very cool, and other rap artists weighed in. Chance the rapper said it well. Because you're black does not mean you're a Democrat. Then came the role reversals. Conservatives have never much liked Kanye because of this comment That's after impossible. Katrina. George Bush doesn't care about black people. But now... Kanye looks and he sees black unemployment at the lowest it's been in the history of our country. He sees that stuff and he's smart. And he says, you know what? Trump is doing a much better job than the Democrats did. And the liberal community quickly cooled on Kanye. We have the right to independent thought. And I independently think that Kanye has lost his mind. <laughs> Like, Why wouldn't you take him seriously? Because he's Why? not a serious no, no, no. person. Why he's like a provocateur. That's your that's your opinion, but uh, he's oh. actually a serious businessman. As the backlash built, Kanye's celebrity wife, Kim Kardashian, tweeted that the media are trying to demonize him, that the commentary on Kanye being erratic or having mental health issues is actually scary. For Kanye's sin of speaking his mind, musical icons like Drake, Kendrick Lamar, Nicki Minaj, and Rihanna unfollowed him on social media. What a punishment. The finger pointing has gotten personal. Singer John Legend begged Kanye to abandon Trump, saying, many people who love you feel betrayed right now because they know the harm that Trump's policies cause, especially to people of color. Kanye says he loves Legend back, but that's a tactic based on fear used to manipulate my free thought. The president tweeting again today, Kanye West has performed a great service to the black community. This is all very entertaining, a hip-hop melodrama featuring two wealthy self-promoters with huge Twitter followings. But there's a serious side as well. Kanye West breaking the mold of black identity politics by embracing a Republican president. Brett? Might get invited to the White House. Who knows? Uh, the president, Howie, is skipping tomorrow night's White House Correspondents' Dinner. What's the strategy there? He'll be counter-programming, just like last year, with a rally in the other Washington. This is Washington, Michigan, where I'll go out on a limb and predict he'll take some shots at the press. But he's also out with a fundraising letter saying, why would I want to be stuck in a room with a bunch of fake news liberals who hate me? So the president is deliberately using the media as a political foil to get his supporters riled up and perhaps writing some checks. All right, Howie, thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank Up you. next, finding her footing. A look at how Melania Trump is making her mark as first lady. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 47 in Lansing, where Michigan voters will get to vote this November on whether to allow
recreational marijuana after officials certified there were enough signatures to put the measure on the ballot. If it passes, it would make Michigan the 10th state to legalize the drug for recreational purposes. Fox 10 in Phoenix, where thousands of Arizona educators wrapped up a second day of state capitol protests and a historic statewide teacher walkout. Protesters are hoping to get new funding for public education. The protests there, similar to another one being held in Colorado, where thousands of teachers have been demonstrating overpay for teachers there. And this is a live look at Milwaukee from our affiliate Fox 6. The big story there tonight, an evacuation order was lifted today following a refinery plant explosion that sent black smoke billowing into the air Thursday, injuring at least 13 people. The mayor of Northwest Wisconsin City said all indications are the refinery site is safe and stable and the air quality is back to normal. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. Obviously, a lot has been said about the president and his administration, but this week, the first lady, Melania Trump, was put to the test with several big events. Tonight, correspondent Kristen Fisher looks at how she's doing. It's been one of Melania Trump's biggest and busiest weeks as first lady, from hosting the prime minister of Japan and his wife at Mar-a-Lago to attending the funeral of Barbara Bush by herself to planning and executing her first state dinner. Thank you, Melania. The former chief of staff to Laura Bush, Anita McBride, gives her an A+. For someone brand new coming into this process without having had the experience of being in politics before, she has done this very carefully with great uh, interest and respect for the role. For a first lady of fewer words than most of her predecessors, Melania Trump has often let her fashion speak for her. And the hat she wore to welcome the French president and his wife to the White House spoke volumes. It was a statement, absolutely, that I am proud to be doing this. I'm proud to be first lady of the United States. But something else about that moment stood out to McBride, something she's never seen before. The first ladies on the podium with the president. It is a position of strength. You are a partner to the presidency. And standing at that podium conveyed that. It also conveyed that this was her event, a state dinner that she had planned without any help outside the White House staff, and she got rave reviews. First Lady Melania Trump shines as host and planner. The glamorous state dinner honoring the French president and his wife is helping Melania Trump become a more visible First Lady. So help me God. The media has often portrayed Melania as the reluctant First Lady, waiting months to move to Washington and waiting into the spotlight only for banner events like the White House Easter egg roll. She worked so hard on this event, and so I want to thank you. Yeah, that's true. Not a chance she did one thing to help set that up. There's no... She didn't die eggs. She's also been criticized for making cyberbullying her signature issue. I just don't think she's the right messenger for cyberbullying because she can't seem to control it in her own home. But Melania's finding her voice. I'm well aware that people are skeptical of me discussing this topic, but it will not stop me from doing what I know is right. Now, keep in mind, the First Lady still hasn't officially announced her platform. When she does, her spokeswoman says it'll expand to include children's issues more broadly. So, Brett, maybe this week of good reviews will expedite that announcement. That was a busy week. It was. Yeah. Kristen, thank you. Thank you. Former NBC News anchor Tom Brokaw is being accused of sexual misconduct by a woman who worked as a correspondent for NBC News. Linda Vester told NBC or news outlets that Tom Brokaw groped her twice, trying forcibly to kiss her and making inappropriate overtures, attempting to have an affair. Vester, who also worked at one time here at Fox News, says it happened in the 1990s. Brokaw admits to meeting with Vester but denies doing anything inappropriate. Congressman Patrick Meehan will not wait to resign. The Pennsylvania Republican sent a letter of resignation effective today after previously announcing he would not seek re-election to the House in November. Meehan is resigning from Congress to end the Ethics Committee's investigation into allegations he sexually harassed a former staffer and said he also plans to pay back the $39,000 paid to settle that case. <laughs> In tonight's Whatever Happened To segment, Atlantic City. It was practically given up for dead a few years ago. Tonight, the odds for a comeback are definitely in its favor. Here's senior correspondent Rick Leventhal. 
Once called the eighth greatest wonder of the world, the Trump Taj Mahal was the last of five casinos to give up on Atlantic City between 2014 and 2016. And many predicted the end was near for this once booming seaside town. But the boom is back. Two shuttered casinos are reopening this summer, including the former Rebel, renamed Ocean Resort. The seven others have stabilized earnings, and nearly all were in the black last year, led by Borgata, which turned a $300 million profit. High-end apartments are under construction, and thousands of jobs are waiting to be filled, with military veterans getting an extra look, since vet unemployment is higher here than the national average. I have a master's in business, so I'm here hoping to get a job either in business or accounting. And you? I'm just kind of open to different possibilities. We realize now this is this is our best second chance. We're not going to get this again. And I think there's an energy, not only in the industry, but also in government, realizing that we have to make it right this time. I like to call it the rebirth. Mayor Frank Gilliam says the key to AC's comeback is making sure locals are involved. Without employment, you cannot actually have a clean city. Without a clean city, you will not have investors interested in coming in the city. You know, everybody wants to be in at the bottom, um, but one of the things that happens when you're at the bottom, it looks kind of scary. Joe Gingoli is part of the team rebuilding the Taj into the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, investing $500 million to gut and renovate the sprawling property with 2,000 rooms, 20 restaurants, and a 7,000-seat arena and separate theater offering 300 live shows a year. You still have close to 30 million people within a three-hour drive of Atlantic City. You still have the world-famous boardwalk and beaches and all the amazing attractions of the Jersey Shore that we think we can re-energize that to come back and give Atlantic City a second look. The Hard Rock's grand opening is set for June 28th, and there's a lot of cautious optimism here. People say the town is re-energized and ready, but of course, there are no sure bets, and there's a lot riding on this latest roll of the dice. Right? Rick Leventhal in Atlantic City. Rick, thanks. Up next, big moment in the DMZ. Our panel weighs in what this all means for the president's possible meeting with Kim Jong-un. First beyond our borders tonight, a call for ease of tensions along China's border with India. Chinese President Xi Jinping calling for stepped-up cooperation with India during an informal summit today with India's prime minister amid tensions along their contested border and a rivalry over influence in Asia. An Indian Ministry of External Affairs spokesman tweeted that the leaders would, quote, review the developments. Weekly protests along the Gaza border with Israel turned deadly again today. Gaza's health ministry says three Palestinians were killed by Israeli gunfire while trying to breach the Gaza border. Protesters rally at the border every Friday as part of a campaign against the decade-old blockade of that territory. Since it began, 35 Palestinians have been killed and more than 1,500 wounded. Great Britain's newest prince has a name now. Kensington Palace announced Louis Arthur Charles as the name of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge's baby boy. The palace said the baby's full title is His Royal Highness Prince Louis of Cambridge. Congratulations. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. We'll be right back. The United States has been played beautifully like a fiddle. Uh, because you had a different kind of a leader. We're not going to be played. Things have changed very radically from a few months ago. We're setting up meetings now. We're down to two countries as to a site. Something very dramatic could happen. We're committed to achieving permanent, verifiable, irreversible dismantling of North Koreans' weapons of mass destruction programs without delay. It's certainly something that I hope I can do for the world. Well, it was a big moment uh, with the two leaders, North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un, and South Korea's president coming to the DMZ, the area that we've seen before between the two countries, stepping over into each other's territory and talking, uh, laying the groundwork for possible peace and also laying the groundwork for President Trump's um, meeting with Kim Jong-un. This follows, obviously, the CIA director Mike Pompeo's visit to North Korea over Easter weekend and a picture of him uh, shaking hands with the North Korean leader. What about this? We'll start there. A lot to cover today with this news conference at the White House. Let's bring in our panel. Byron York, political correspondent, chief political correspondent for The Washington Examiner, A.B. Stoddard, associate editor at Real Clear Politics and host of No Labels Radio on Sirius XM, and Jason Riley, Wall Street Journal columnist and senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Jason, your thoughts on what we heard from the president today? Well, um, uh, I didn't see a lot of warmth there between uh, 
Angela, Angela Merkel, Merkel and, and Donald Trump. Um, still a little bit of a frosty. It's a little different than the France, France visits. A, a little different, but interestingly, I think both France and Germany want something similar here. They don't, uh, they're, they're, they're wary of the U.S. pulling out of the Iran deal. Uh, they don't like Trump's uh, talks of tariffs on imports of uh, aluminum and steel, so they're, they're trying to get him to uh, scale that back or at least give them exemptions on that front. So you see some, some similarities there. But what I saw is some very strong language out of Donald Trump, particularly with regard to Iran and, 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 and how he is going to make sure that uh, we provide a deterrence to them acquiring nuclear weapons. And, France seemed a little more open to that. Uh, uh, Macron seemed a little more open to that, particularly when it comes to things like sunset provisions that we're concerned about, or inspections, where we can go. Uh, he seems open to, to at least making another deal that addresses some of these concerns. I'm not sure if Merkel is quite there yet. On Korea, uh, the president tweeting a furious year of missile launches, nuclear testing, historic meeting between the North and South now taking place. Good things are happening. Only time will tell. Korean War to end. The United States and all of its great people should be very proud of what's now taking place in Korea. Please do not forget the great help that my good friend President Xi of China has given to the United States, particularly at the border of North Korea. Without him, it would have been a much longer, tougher process. I mean, they're laying the groundwork here. Uh, for something really significant. Yeah, I mean, it, it, look, this is all good news, and the president deserves uh, all the credit for whatever he has done to push the Chinese to the table in terms of enforcement and, of course, to get the sanctions passed, this t very tough sanctions through the UN that, um, that are obviously inflicting pain uh, on the regime uh, in North Korea. The, the meeting last night, you know, it was not unprecedented that these two sides would talk, but the actual physical meeting and, and everything um, bodes very well. They didn't get specific. They didn't promise to end the Korean War. We don't know exactly what they're, they didn't commit to any pledges, but it, it's very, very hopeful. And I thought it was very interesting that the president took pains to credit uh, President Xi uh, for, for, for really being, for enforcing the sanctions and for being a credible partner. Um, I think the South Koreans and the North Koreans, obviously the North Koreans would like to separate us from the Chinese and the South Koreans. The Japanese are very skeptical. There's an entirely possible scenario in which he has developed his, his nuclear weapons program so far that he can get to the table and say, guess what? It's been great meeting with you. Um, I might talk to you about a freeze in exchange for some things, but I'm not going to dismantle. At which and point, I haven't, this president says, Byron, he's going to walk away. Right. He doesn't do that. Yes, but I mean, this atmosphere is just an incredible change change from the threats we were seeing being exchanged not very long ago. And you have to have all of the caveats. Kim can't be trusted. There have been these North-South agreements before that never went anywhere. And the U.S. has to make sure it always rewards only actions, never rewards promises. But on the other hand, th this is a big deal. And there's one person who is more responsible than anybody else for it. And that is uh, President Trump. It's, it's the sanctions and also this attitude of, I just might be crazy enough to to do something that seems to have made something happen. Sure, yeah. but but Byron's right. We've had North-South agreements before. We've had these summits before. We've had these joint declarations before. Fact of the matter is, the the North Korean Constitution calls for the end of South Korea. It has since 1953. It still does. We have no specifics on that. We have nothing on human rights here. Um, the most reassuring thing I've heard, though, is what you just referred to. President Trump says he is willing to walk away. I, I, I hope that the president doesn't feel if he gets into this room or into these meetings, I've got to cut a deal or I'll look like a failure. No. Unless you're going to get something substantive, I hope he is just willing to walk away because the, the North Koreans cannot be trusted. Here's the president today on the House Intel report. He was happy about it. It says no collusion on this Russia investigation. I was very honored by the report. It was totally conclusive. There was no collusion uh, with Russia, if you can believe this one. Uh, there was, she probably can't believe it. Who can? The committee did not use its subpoena power for bank records, for phone records. Uh, it's basically a kindergarten report. Uh, it was a light once-over. 
So obviously Democrats, Byron, not, not happy with the report. Uh, the findings, the pattern of Russian attacks, cyber attacks meet uh, both the U.S. and Europe. Uh, none of the interviewed witnesses provide evidence of collusion, coordination, or conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russia. Opposition research on Trump makes its way from Russian sources to the Clinton campaign. Problematic contacts between senior intelligence community officials and the media. I do want to play this uh, one of the other things that comes out of it is about Mike Flynn, and I asked uh, Jim Comey about that. Did you tell lawmakers that FBI agents didn't believe former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn was lying intentionally to investigators? No. You did and, not And I that. saw that in the media. I don't know what. Maybe someone misunderstood something I said. I didn't believe that and didn't say that. If he does not remember telling Congress that his agents told him they didn't think Flynn was lying, then he needs to get his lawyers to go back and look at the transcript. Um, we did not mishear. Maybe he misspoke, uh, but that's in the transcript. So in this report, uh, General Flynn pleaded guilty to making a false statement to the Federal Bureau of Investigation regarding his December 2016 conversations uh, with the Russian ambassador, Kislyak, even though the Federal Bureau of Investigation agents did not detect any deception during Flynn's interview. Byron. Well, um, uh, 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 James Comey has denied this a couple of times so far. It has been reported, I reported it not too long ago, that uh, in this meeting in March of 2017, uh, Congress had been demanding briefings from Comey, and he, he indeed told them that. The key word here is transcript. That's what Trey Gowdy was talking about, his meeting with the House Intelligence Committee was transcribed. And you have to think that it's probably in this report that just got released today. If anybody's looked at this report, there's big black sections of things that are redacted. And the House committee said, not all of this stuff is classified and we are going to release a less redacted version of it in the near future. Quickly, A.B., even Gowdy has said, listen, Mueller is the big kahuna here because there were witnesses they wanted to talk to, they didn't talk to in this House Intel report. Yeah, um, there are just things that Mueller can do that these committees on Capitol couldn't do, and the process broke down. It was a tainted partisan process. This report is not credible. I don't give any credence to the Democratic report. We should all be waiting for what Bob Mueller comes up with. We shall see. Next up, the Friday Lightning Round. Kanye looks and he sees black unemployment at the lowest it's been in the history of our country, okay? He sees Hispanic unemployment at the lowest it's been in the history of our country. He's smart, and he says, you know what? Trump is doing a much better job than the Democrats did. We should have a real discussion about the underlying policies that are leading towards the best economy and the best economic activity in minority communities we've seen in a very long time. Well, this became a thing. Wednesday, this tweet by Kanye West. You don't have to agree with Trump, but the mob can't make me not love him. We are both Dragon Energy, which I think is a great name for a caffeinated drink. Uh, he is my brother. I love everyone. I don't agree with everything anyone does. That's what makes us individuals, and we have the right to independent thought. Okay, lightning round. Uh, Jason. Uh, I don't look for validation uh, to rappers and hip hop artists, and I don't think the president should either. Uh, this is the same Kanye West that a few years back was telling America that George W. Bush hates black people. Brett, this is the same Kanye West that makes a very good living trafficking in the worst stereotypes about black people in general and black men in particular. Uh, no thank you. Uh, President Bush should be out there talking about what this economy is doing for, for blacks and Hispanics and so forth. I'm not sure that Kanye West needs to be part of that conversation. But part of the conversation, Byron, is that the left's heads are exploding on this very issue. Well, the left's heads are exploding in part because of what Chance the Rapper said, which is that black people don't have to be Democrats. So there's actually a, a serious question that has been raised by all this that you will see actual debate about. This has been something Republicans have said they wanted to do, that is, attract more black votes. They've said that for a long time, haven't really worked very hard at it. Uh, it'd be very interesting to see what happens here. Meanwhile, A.B., uh, the caravan that we've heard so much about is actually arriving at the border uh, and will be stopped. Uh, and the officials are saying they're going to be stopped at the border and referred to pro for prosecution, according to the DHS secretary. <laughs> 
It's been such a busy week, we forgot to fear the caravan. I was waiting for it to come back. Um, this is obviously, you know, a serious matter the federal government is taking care of, but President Trump likes to talk about this um, when when he wants to distract from another conversation or he feels frustrated politically. Um, this new ruling basically um, enshrines DACA. The judge said this this policy statements from the White House about this are virtually unexplained and capricious and arbitrary. And this is basically because nothing's going to happen on Capitol Hill and the president has been capricious and arbitrary on this. This is going to give a blanket um, protection to dreamers and take this issue off off the table yeah, entirely. Legislatively, it just doesn't look like it's going to be addressed uh, anytime soon. Winners and losers, quickly, Byron. The uh, winner is Mitch McConnell, who is confirming presidential, uh, President Trump's judicial nominees at a record pace. Uh, the 15th was 15th Circuit Court of Appeals judge done this week. That is more than any president, any of the last five presidents at this point in his presidency. There are going to be six more soon. Uh, the loser is uh, Joy Reid, the MSNBC anchor who more than a decade ago blogged a opinions about homosexuality that are wildly out of step with progressive politics and is now yet another person finding it's very hard to deal with the record of what they wrote many years ago. NBC had a tough week. Uh, winner and loser? Uh, my winner is Melania Trump, uh, not because of her beautiful state dinner and everything she did to welcome the Macrons, but for her uh, beautiful act of grace last Saturday, inviting a former White House maitre d' and, a cur and the current White House usher to Barbara Bush's funeral because as both of them were close to the bushes. My loser uh, is the generic Scott Pruitt defender. You know who you are. We all heard his testimony this week. We've all read about his many infractions and his disregard for the ethics expected in his job, pretending that it is the fault of the environmental lobby that Scott Pruitt doesn't play by the rules is a ridiculous argument. Winner and loser. Uh, my winner is James Shaw, the Waffle House hero who not only took the gun from the shooter, but has now been raising money for victims of this tragedy. I know he rejects the hero label, but I think he's going to be stuck with it for a while. Uh, my loser, Brett, is Bill Cosby, one of the, the most famous entertainers uh, perhaps in the history of this country, uh, who was convicted of sexual assault, just a, a, an epic downfall in terms of his career, though I am glad that his accusers have now received some measure of justice, even it's, though it's been a very long time in coming. Panel, thank you. My winner, special report staff, we made it to Friday. When we come back, the best thing said on camera this week.